devoted mother disappears, loved ones fear the worst. No matter where Jolene was at, she would always answer her phone. I just felt like something bad had happened and that she wouldn't be back. A woman with a history of choosing the wrong man. She didn't always pick the best guys. I don't know why. She could always do so much better. I got the text message from other people saying he's bad dude. Crosses a stranger with a secret past. She went by around 17 different aliases. She had several driver's licenses in different states. We just didn't know what we had at that point. It was this lady. You know, she can hold off. She can be the most charming person ever in snap. The search uncovers an overwhelming amount of lies and unspeakable violence. And you say, holy crap, you know, something really serious happened in here. She stabbed me in the chest. She bit my dad in the leg. She was extremely jealous. She was very controlling. She was at times very violent. This is a, a weird, evil woman. charm of Fernandina Beach, Florida makes it a favorite destination for locals and visitors alike. Fernandina Beach is located on Amelia Island. It's in the very northeastern corner of Florida, just above Jacksonville. It's a little island. Everybody knows everybody. Um, and so it's a great place to grow up and raise a family. But on May 14th, 2018, a feeling of dread settles over the beach town when Ann Johnson calls the local sheriff's office to report her 34-year-old daughter, Jolene Cummings, missing. We originally got a call from Ann Johnson, and she said the last time somebody spoke to Jolene was May 12th, and a couple days later, no one had still heard from her. Ann says she began to on Sunday, May 13th, when Jolene failed to pick up her two sons after their week-long visit with their father. The kid's father contacted her mother, Ann Johnson, said, you know where Jolene's at? She's supposed to pick the kids up, and they didn't know where she was. What's more, the Sunday of May 13th was a very special day for Jolene and her kids. Her mother told me. Jolene's mother reported that she had not been able to reach her by phone. It was a big concern that she couldn't be found because she does have kids. She loves her kids. So certainly you want to try to find them as soon as possible. I just felt like something bad had happened and that she wouldn't be back. Born on May 13th, 1984, Jolene Jensen was a small town girl who loved her family fiercely. It was just Jolene and her mom and her stepdad. They had a good relationship. They were always together, having family dinners. Joyful and energetic, Jolene drew people in. Jolene had a large circle of friends. Everybody loved Jolene. After graduating high school, Jolene left for cosmetology school. But she knew she would never be gone for long. Jolene was very much a small town girl. She wanted to own a salon. Um, so the small town is best for that. After a few years away and a failed relationship that left her a single mother, Jolene moved back to her hometown. Jolene was very excited to be a mom. Um, she didn't always pick the best guys. I don't know why. She could always do so much better. She worked at Tangles Hair Salon in Fernandina Beach. The salon we worked at was a very family-friendly place. We had fun there. Everybody got along. You know, had together. She was the light of the salon. Jolene used this time to build toward her dreams. She advertised herself a lot on social media and she built a very good clientele. I never knew a day that she wasn't booked. Jolene's career was taking off and when she met Jason Cummings, her personal life quickly followed suit. After the birth of their first son in 2013, they married, 
and Jolene gave birth to another boy in 2015. She was so obsessed with those babies that nothing else mattered. Those kids came first. Although Jolene was overjoyed to grow her family, her marriage to Jason soon began to fray. They didn't have a very good relationship in the end, but she, she kept trying. She loved him. And she always put her men and her kids before anything. The two separated in 2017. She wasn't real talkative about Jason. She was focused on her kids. They would go visit their father, but her kids always lived with Jolene. But after her past failed relationships, Jolene wanted to keep this one to herself. With men, she was a very private girl. I knew she was dating a new guy. Um, and at times when I would see her, she was very excited. It was new. It was butterflies. Jolene was enjoying motherhood, a flourishing career, and a growing romance. It seemed all of the pieces of her life were falling into place. Until May 14, 2018, when the reliable mother is nowhere to be found. Everyone was panicking. We didn't know what could have happened. We still held on to the hope that she was okay somewhere. But it was like deep down we knew better. Local authorities start their search by contacting the first person to notice Jolene's absence, her estranged husband, Jason Cummings. Jolene was going through a divorce with her husband, Jason Cummings, and the final custody had not been determined. A custody dispute can be a huge motivator to possibly do violence. I wanted to meet with him in person. Jason agrees to come to the sheriff's office the next day for an interview, and investigators continue to call more of Jolene's family and friends. Through contacting people who know her and doing interviews with them, the last place that we could determine that Jolene was seen was at her place of employment at Tangles Hair Salon on the 12th of May. We talked to the salon owner. We got the names of the people who were working that day. She uh, had Jolene Cummings, who had been with her for um, several years. Ann Morgan, who had been there for approximately 10 years, and she had a, uh, a newer employee who had only been there for a couple of months, and her name was Jennifer Seibert. The salon owner says Jolene and Jennifer closed the salon on Saturday, May 12th, around 5 p.m. Well, we knew the type of vehicle that Jolene drove was not anywhere near the salon, and the salon had a camera, but it was not working. We did attempt to ping her cell phone, and the cell phone was either uh, not working or it had been turned off. We checked her bank records. We checked social media accounts. None of those had had any uh, activity since the last day that she had worked, which was on May 12th. We know that uh, after that, nobody had seen her. So the focus of our timeline was basically between the 12th and the 14th. Investigators immediately release a description of Jolene and her vehicle to the local news and reach out to her co-worker, Jennifer. We asked if Jolene mentioned anything about going anywhere. Jennifer, when it was investigation, she stated that she had an ex-boyfriend who was a computer expert and that he was a stalker. And if her name was listed anywhere, he would track her down. I said, I just need to know, did you work with Jolene on Saturday? And if she discussed any upcoming plans... Jennifer stated that her and Jolene were not close, that Jolene was acting normally, and that uh, she didn't mention any upcoming plans for the weekend. With concern for Jolene mounting, detectives dig deeper into her history. If somebody's reported missing, we're going to look for recent police reports. I had discovered a previous police report on the 9th of May. There had been a domestic situation. Jason G. had come over and asked to spend the night. Um, when she told him he could not spend the night, uh, he got upset. Detectives then arranged to meet Jolene's stepfather at her home to conduct a wellness check. And what they find is concerning. That afternoon on Monday the 14th, we noticed that the residence was secured, but uh, once entering in, the uh, house looked a little bit in disarray. 
there are some cabinet doors that were loose, some holes in the walls. We actually reached out to an officer who had responded there, and he advised that that was typical for that house. Coming up, detectives suspect that Jolene's disappearance could be connected to her complicated love life. We did discover that sometimes Jolene may not have made the best decisions with the guy she chose to date. We'd call him, he'd hang up, we'd go to his house, he's not there. It seemed like he's trying to avoid us. May 15th, 2018. It's been three days since 34-year-old mother Jolene Cummings was last seen. No one knew what had happened, but we had a feeling something bad had happened. After finding her house in disarray, investigators start looking into the men in Jolene's life, beginning with her estranged husband, Jason Cummings. Jolene was going through a divorce with her husband. If somebody's reported missing and going through a separation or a divorce, um, you know, the person involved with that's going to be one of the first people we look at. Three days after Jolene's disappearance, Jason sits down with detectives for an interview. Shins. I looked very old. My dad kicked my ass up all over down this earth. <clears throat> That's my kid's mom. But what I do take seriously is my He gave an alibi of, of uh, being with some, some friends at a specific location all weekend. I asked him for permission to search and download his cellular phone. I didn't find anything of evidentiary value uh, on, the, on the cell phone. He also gave written consents for a search of his vehicle. We actually had a crime scene unit go out and examine it and take photos of it. But we saw nothing inside the vehicle of a suspicious nature. Before the interview is over, Jason Cummings has a question about the other man in Jolene's life. Can you please tell me about this guy? She has a guy she's been seeing, and we're looking into that. I'm trying to locate him for an interview. I've got a text message from other people saying he's bad news. But she's never just been seen. I've never met him. I've never met him there, so. Detectives find Jason Cummings has never been charged nor convicted of any crimes against Jolene. So they release him while they work to confirm his alibi. At that point in time, we, we began to look for Jolene's boyfriend, Jason G., whose name and information I had discovered in a domestic incident. There was no physical violence documented, but it was documented that he had gotten angry and damaged the cabinets in the home. When we tried to contact Jason G., we'd call him, he'd hang up. Uh, we'd go to his house, he's not there. It seemed like he's trying to avoid us. He had an active warrant for violation of probation. And we knew that he was dodging that, but still, the, the more he, he dodged us, um, he certainly was becoming more of a suspect. Investigators concentrate more resources on locating Jason. We were also looking at his background, uh, in any relatives, any friends, any locations that he frequented. Jason G. was eventually found in Hilliard, Florida. He had a relative that lived there. Law enforcement went to the relative's house. He was hiding under some boxes in a bedroom. Authorities arrest Jason G. on an outstanding warrant and bring him in for an interview. Jason G. had some, some criminal history and some pressures with the law. You pronounce your last name G or D? You're here on a probation violation, okay? You are in custody. You're not free to leave. Um, I want to talk to you about something else. Can we go just kind of fast and begin with how you guys got to live together? I went over to the party and I mean, just got together with this guy. That's how I was saying there was a night when he got an argument and she was accusing me of messing around on us. I went over there to see what was in the house. Um, there was some cabinets broken, there was some holes and stuff. Did, did that happen that night? No. And what about the, uh, what about there was some holes in the door where somebody pushed me? That was a long time ago. 
detectives pressed Jason G for his whereabouts on the day Jolene went missing. They got the shoes at work on Saturday. I'm going to buy sort of her first. I'm going to buy one of them on the 5th and 7th Saturday. When's the last time you talked to her? Oh, so, well, I don't know what to say. Saturday. Okay. Was she at work or where was she at? She was, it was not taking She was at work because it was like 3 50 something. 3 7 I think. For detectives, this information raises a red flag. It's the same day Jolene was last seen and only an hour before the salon closed. Do you still have the messages in your phone from... I don't have a phone, but yeah, I'm sure you can get to the phone but yeah. Do you want to have it? No, sir. The whereabouts of Jason's phone fuels only more suspicion. He's known he's going to sit in jail for a little while. He's obviously angry with law enforcement, but when it comes to Jolene, you know, his demeanor did change. He seemed legitimately concerned that she was missing. Investigators need to confirm Jason's alibi, but first, they head to the last place Jolene was spotted, the salon. We had no other indication she was anywhere else. Nobody seen her after work, and no one had seen her leave work. We didn't know what time or if Jolene Cummings actually walked out of the hair salon. Coming up, a potential witness refuses to cooperate with police. He called her, owner, today, I'm quitting. You come out of my check. I can't be involved in any police activity. And new evidence sends investigators on a hunt for a mysterious suspect. Once the vehicle is parked, a minute or so later, you can see someone exit the driver's side. of three, Jolene Cummings has been missing for more than 48 hours. Up until now, the investigation has centered on Jolene's former spouse, Jason Cummings, and her boyfriend, Jason G. Both men say they were visiting friends and family the weekend of Jolene's disappearance. Jason Cummings gave us all of his phones and we could check and see where he was at. And uh, so we could eliminate him as being a person of interest or even a suspect. Despite having a criminal record, detectives are also able to clear Jason G. Jason G gave an alibi that he was at some friend's house in Jacksonville. We sent detectives to talk to the friends in Jacksonville who confirmed that he was there. Jason G's father confirmed that he was the one who transported him. With their leads dwindling, authorities decide to circle Back to the location where Jolene was last seen, the salon. One of our detectives went to the hair salon, and while he's in there speaking to the owner of the hair salon, Jennifer Seibert comes to the shop. Only Jennifer Seibert and Jolene Cummings were working that day. So Jennifer was the last person that we know seen her. The owner of the shop actually told Jennifer, hey, there's a detective in here that wants to speak to you. Jennifer makes it clear once again that she doesn't want to get involved. She decided she didn't want to have any part of the police. As she leaves, she said, hey, I'm quitting. Uh, you come out of my check. Uh, I can't be involved in any police activity, which <laughs> is a concern. I thought it was very unusual, but there are certainly people who don't like law enforcement um, and don't want contact with law enforcement. As detectives prepare to look deeper into Jennifer's background, they receive their biggest tip yet. Well, after we put the flyer out for Jolene's vehicle, we did receive a call from an individual who thought he'd seen that vehicle in a Home Depot parking lot. When we responded, we verified that it was Jolene's car. When we searched the vehicle, we did not see any kind of uh, blood or anything of evidential value. Once we found her vehicle, it gave us a place to start and to work backwards from there. 
So what we did was we looked for surveillance video. When investigators pull video surveillance from a nearby bank, they make a startling discovery. Early in the morning, the 13th, at about 1.17, you could see the vehicle being driven into the Home Depot parking lot. A minute or so later, you can see someone exit the driver's side. The driver, but investigators can see the figure walk to a nearby gas station. One of the videos was from a gate gas station. It was a very clear video showing the female wearing all black enter into the store. Once she enters into the gas station and walks up near the counter, the surveillance is even clearer. And, you know, judging off the driver's license picture I have, I'm like, that's Jennifer Cyber. With this new revelation, on Wednesday, May 16th, investigators return to Jolie's place of work for a closer look. The salon had been closed since uh, Jolene Cummings' disappearance due to the fact that the salon's normally closed Sunday, Monday, on Tuesday when the owner showed up to open up the business. She had no employees there to cut hair. The salon being closed was pretty important in that nobody had cleaned anything, nothing had been disturbed. When the crime scene unit applies luminol, a chemical that reacts with blood, hidden horrors are revealed. Just lit up, and you say, holy crap. You know, something really serious happened here. That was really the moment when I said, I'm working a homicide investigation. And our number one priority at that point in time is to find Jennifer Cyber. Detectives send samples of the blood evidence for DNA testing. While they wait for results, they release a bolo for Jennifer's vehicle and ping her phone. Location data places her somewhere in neighboring St. John's County. St. John's County, which is a couple counties south of Nassau, she had given a false address to her employer. Instructions were given to check any area where somebody needed to stay or sleep in their car. We were informed, hey, she's a transient sometimes. She's living out of her vehicle. So we went to a rest area. I was not expecting to find her vehicle. But when I looked to my left and saw her black Kia... Between two semis, I knew it was her. I made a phone call to another detective. I told him, hey, her vehicle's here. Several uh, detectives quickly responded to, to St. John's County, including myself. We approached, and it appeared that there was someone sleeping in the vehicle. At that time, I gave the person verbal commands to step out of the vehicle with their hands visible. Jennifer Seibert exited the, the front door of the vehicle. She had a nasty cut on her face. Her story was she was riding a bicycle and ran into a tree. We asked her, have you ever been in Jolene's vehicle? She said, no, never have. At that point in time, I knew she was lying. I then confronted her and said, I don't believe you. At that time, she said, well, if you don't believe me, maybe I need an attorney. Investigators place Jennifer under arrest and transport her to the St. John's County Jail. We originally charged Jennifer Cyber with grand theft of Jolene's vehicle. We need to continue gathering evidence, uh, looking for, for any clues, certainly looking to see if we can find Jolene somewhere. They start by canvassing the area around the salon for more surveillance footage. We did discover a camera for the alleyway behind Tangles where the dumpsters are located. In that video, you can see Jennifer Seibert exiting the uh, rear of the business with large garbage bags and throwing them into the dumpster behind the business. For several hours after Tangles was closed on the 12th of May. Footage further shows a truck emptying the dumpster on May 14th just two hours after Jolene was reported missing. We contacted the the company that services the dumpsters, and they were able to give us a general area of where that particular truck dumped. We asked them to isolate that area so we could later search it. Authorities obtain a search warrant for Jennifer's car. We found a bag in there with combs and scissors. The screw that attaches two pieces of scissors together. There was a little bit of a darker color. 
colored substance in there. It could have been rust. It could have been anything. It was something we need to have analyzed. We did that, and it did uh, come back as positive for not just blood, but Jolene's blood. I did believe at that point that we had located the murder weapon. Detectives also discover a record of purchases made by Jennifer at Walmart around 9 p.m. May 12th, the last day Jolene was seen alive. The ticket went to the Walmart and obtained video surveillance. She bought ammonia, large trash bags, gloves, and a carving knife. Detectives re-examine the hours of surveillance footage and quickly realize that after Jennifer purchased the items at Walmart, she returned to the salon. Over an hour later, she emerges and continues her trips to the dumpster. What really floored me was the electric knife. When I saw that, I'm thinking she cut Jolene up, stuffed her in those black trash bags, and threw her away like garbage. Shocking confession with a twist no one sees coming. I'm 50 years old. I've been running from the FBI for over 25 years. At the time, I had no idea if this was true or not true. All of a sudden, there's this information with a little girl named Jennifer Seibert, same date of birth, who died in a car accident in Germany at 13 years old. It just gave us chills. Jolene Cummings is missing and presumed dead. Her co-worker, Jennifer Seibert, is in custody after surveillance video shows her stealing Jolene's vehicle. But blood evidence now points to a much darker crime. When the luminol uh, lit up the salon, it was obviously uh, a lot of blood. At that point, we knew we had a murder on our hands. The amounts of blood that were found on the on the walls and the floor, there were samples of those collected. Uh, they were sent, uh, and they did come back as Joey's DNA. The evidence was mounting, and we knew that this crime occurred inside Tangles. When you, ever, you have a murder and you can't locate the body, it's a difficult case. You have to have overwhelming evidence. Investigators search the landfill where they believe Jolene's body may be located. The area was enormous. It was almost inconceivable the amount of refuse that we went through. We analyzed what we could, but um, nothing of evidentiary value was found. Investigators search for a potential motive by interviewing the staff about Jennifer and Jolene's relationship. When Jennifer Seibert first went to work at Tangles, it seemed like her and Jolene got along very well. But as time went on, there was tension and eventually downright just dislike between the two. Jolene had all the clients. I don't think she was making the money that Jolene was making. Jolene had talked to me about Jennifer and said that something was really weird with her. Another co-worker, Anne Morgan, who has worked with Jolene for nearly six years, claims that the day before her disappearance, Jolene and Jennifer argued. Jolene, say, go away. I don't want to talk to you. You fake. You crazy, you fake. She told me, say, Miss Ann, something about Jennifer that I cannot put my hand on it. She's not right. I want to find out who Detectives believe that the cryptic confrontation may have led to Jolene's murder. Something triggered uh, Jennifer to do this. What exactly it was, we don't know. On May 18th, after two days in custody, Jennifer drops a bombshell. Thomas will tell you, when you want to run my fingerprints through, they come out as Kimberly Lee Kessler. Um, I was born in May of 1968, May 9th. I'm 50 years old. I've been running from the FBI for over 25 years. We just didn't know what we had at that point. It was this lady. What does she 
she about? Where's she from? Kimberly says she grew up in Butler, Pennsylvania. I was an honor roll student. I was a cheerleader. But my mom started to, like, act crazy on me, and I started hanging out with the crowd that would take me in. Kimberly tells investigators that she dropped out of school and left Pennsylvania for something new that proved dangerous. One of my uh, first relationships in Arizona, I was working as a uh, topless dancer at a topless bar in Phoenix. And um, just started going out with him and whatever. And, and um, he was with me whenever he called somebody and they said, the FBI is looking for you. And then he tells me everything. Oh, I brought these bags. And I'm like, what? And I hid him in my apartment. And that was like kind of almost the beginning. Kimberly claims that after the relationship ended, she changed her name and went on the run. I got my real estate license. I had driven a tractor and trailer, which I did in Virginia Beach, Virginia. She stuck by the premise that she was running from an ex who uh, she was afraid of. When the conversation shifts to Jolene, Kimberly quickly shuts it down. <laughs> She thought she were fake. She thought she were phony. She was going to look you up. I don't remember any of that. I think you know where Jolene is. Right. She, she's out there somewhere. Her body's out there somewhere. You're going to look like it. That could happen right now. No, I cannot. What's more, investigators find no proof that anyone is pursuing Kimberly, FBI or otherwise. But at the time, I had no idea what was true or not true. So we set to work on finding out who she was. I typed in the name Jennifer Cyber, date of birth, and all of a sudden there's this information with a, a little girl named Jennifer Cyber, same date of birth. She died at 13 years old. It just gave us chills. She was buried in Butler, Pennsylvania, and we knew that Jennifer was from Butler, Pennsylvania. They suspect she stole the real Jennifer Seibert's identity from her gravestone. A detective contacted the real Jennifer Seibert's father. He was very surprised. He said that he had no idea how um, Kimberly Kessler could have obtained his daughter's information. I worked identity theft before. There's sites you can go to online, dark web and such, and get that kind of thing. Pennsylvania authorities tell detectives that Kimberly Kessler was reported missing by her mother in 2004, when she was 36 years old. She was an adult at the time she went missing. As a matter of fact, her mother waited several years before she even reported her missing. I think she had talked about leaving, getting out of Butler, Pennsylvania. We actually sent an FBI agent to the mother's home and got a DNA swab and discovered, yes, this is truly her daughter. Investigators continue digging, conducting interviews with anyone who knew Kimberly. She dated and lived together for a while. Well, uh, Kim seems to be the most darling, lovable person ever, and she snapped. Talking with people that she had dated in the past, she was extremely jealous. Um, she was very controlling. Uh, she was at times very violent. She stabbed me in the chest. She bit my chest in the leg. When we're interviewing people, we found out she went by around 17 different aliases. She had several driver's licenses in different states. This is a, a weird, evil woman. Come up. Circumstantial evidence continues to mount, but Kimberly presents an unexpected new obstacle. She was just uh, very nasty to her deputies in the jail. She'd actually... Uh, throw crap at him, cuss at him, spit on him, all that. May 2018. It's been eight days since 34-year-old Jolene Cummings went missing. Investigators now suspect the mother of three has been killed by her co-worker, Kimberly Kessler, who has allegedly been on the run and living under false identities for nearly 25 years. However, investigators have yet to recover a body. Nobody I'm 
itself is is evidence, you know, and juries are, are very visual people. A search of Kimberly's cell phone leads to crucial evidence. We have her internet searches, co-worker guilty of murder, and co-worker not found, no body, no crime. There were literally hundreds of searches uh, in reference to Jolene Cummins' disappearance. Despite having no body, on September 7th, 2018, a Nassau County grand jury indicts Kimberly on first-degree murder charges. Once she is behind bars, Kimberly exhibits a string of increasingly concerning behaviors. She would just be very nasty to her deputies in the jail. She'd actually uh, throw crap at them. She'd save them in a cup and uh, smear it on the windows all over her cell. Cuss at them, spit on them, all that. The behaviors warrant enough concern to conduct a mental evaluation to determine if Kimberly is fit to stand trial. She was diagnosed with delusional disorder. Somebody who has shown that they maintain behaviors that are that are not based in any form of fact or reality. Now, if a person is a very, very convincing actor, they could convince somebody that they have delusional disorder. So another psychologist reevaluated Kimberly and based on their assessment found that Kimberly met criteria for an unspecified personality disorder and not a delusional disorder. It's not considered to be that real break from reality that we would see in successful sorts of use of an insanity defense. Well, the judge is actually the one who makes the final decision. He decides she was clearly okay to stand for trial. When Kimberly's trial begins in December 2021, her gaunt appearance is shocking, as are her antics. When she was housed at the, in the Nassau County Jail Detention Facility, she went on a hunger strike. Every time that uh, Kimberly had a court hearing, she would come in and she would be disruptive. So the judge would have her removed. The theatrics do nothing to distract prosecutors from building their case. They present Kimberly as a troubled woman who lashed out when Jolene threatened to uncover her long-kept secret. Uh -huh. For somebody with Kimberly Kessler's personality style, once somebody is onto them, it is not unusual for that person with that personality to get really agitated, to escalate. I believe they got into a physical altercation. Jolene Cummings fought back. But I think Kimberly was able to get a hold of a pair of scissors. That was what incapacitated Jolene Cummings so that the body could be disposed of later on in the back part of the salon. Kimberly Castle likely felt entitled to eliminating Jolene so that she could maintain her own false reality that she had been using to get through the world all of these years. It's actually quite chilling. On December 9th, 2021, the jury convicts 53-year-old Kimberly Kessler of first-degree murder and grand theft auto. She was sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole. To this day, the search for Jolene's body continues, and investigators remain determined to reunite her with her beloved family. I will never give up hope on locating Jolene. I love and miss Jolene very much, and I would like to say to Kimberly, if you have any decency or any feelings whatsoever, at least give the family some closure and tell them where she is. He was a 
man on a mission to get his life back. He was a full-fledged alcoholic. He said, I'm ready. He says, I'm done with all that. He loved going to church. He was like a different person. He came back here and opened up his own mechanic shop. And he was a really good father. But his efforts are cut short one September evening in a peaceful roadside park. The body was still warm. You have a lot of stab wounds. It's something very personal. Why was he there? Investigators suspect that a complicated love life led to bloodshed. He always had a girlfriend. Those relationships go south. People make poor decisions. And bad things happen. So there were a lot of pieces of the wrong guy's life. Ultimately, investigators find one ex-lover with a wicked plot no one saw coming. I didn't even know she had a girlfriend. It was new news. And they had to formulate a plan to keep from disrupting the family that they built. I was just out of control. I never dreamed they, they was capable of what they'd done. Ava, Missouri, a tiny town of just under 3,000 nestled in the picturesque Ozark Mountains. It's a very rural and it's a tight-knit community. It's very common to walk into all the stores and, and people see you and, and speak to you. On September 10th, 2010, a call comes into the Douglas County Sheriff's Department just after 10 p.m. from a roadside park north of town. It's a very pretty little roadside park on Highway 5. It's very undeveloped. It's just a couple picnic tables and things like that. There was just uh, two random people that had driven through the roadside park. They had stopped by uh, to rest as they were leaving. They were driving out and they observed a the body lying in the road. Within minutes, deputies arrived to find a man face down in the road in a pool of blood. The first thing that was obvious to me was a, a gunshot wound to his left temple. The body was still warm when we first arrived, so we were quite confident that he had been laying there very long. Deputies questioned the two people who called 911. They were searched and there was no firearms, there was no knives. Uh, they were there and we were just essentially able to rule them out. They were purely witnesses that drove on the scene and called it in out of concern. Police check the man's wallet for an ID and run the tags on the pickup truck parked nearby. Both belong to 43-year-old Philip Taylor. He lived in an adjoining county. I contacted the sheriff in Wright County and asked him if he was familiar with him, and he was. The sheriff was able to come down and confirm, look at him, and say, yes, that is Philip Taylor. Without a doubt, he knew him. Born in 1966, Phil Taylor was raised in Florida. He grew up close with his brothers and sister, but there was a hole in Phil's life he could never get past. Oh, his dad passed away when he was really young, and that really, you know, fathered him a lot, and he had a lot of trouble with that. His brothers were real close, and he had a sister, too. You could tell that the way they, they, there was real good togetherness there with them. When Phil was a teenager, he developed a love of cars and a passion for learning how they worked. He dropped out of high school to pursue his dream. One of his first jobs was working at a Ford dealership in Florida. The big motor companies would send you to school as long as you work for them, see? And that's where he got a lot of his training. By his mid-twenties, Phil was looking for a change. He left the sunshine and salty air of Florida for the lush green Ozarks. There, he met Marvin Elliott. I had a shop in Norwood, Missouri. We became friends and he went to work for me. Easy to talk to and was just a nice guy. And I knew he was a good mechanic and that's how it started. While in Norwood, he found himself drawn to a down-to-earth single mother and waitress, Melina Cooley. I was working at a little place um, is a little restaurant in town and he was working at a tire shop behind it 
and he came up there and got food, and drinks, whatever. That's how we met. In 1994, Phil married Melina. He moved in with her and her three-year-old daughter, Ashley. I was single for a long time, a um, single mother, and he said a lot of the right things, kind, and I guess just gentleman <laughs> toward me. About a year later, Phil and Melina welcomed a daughter of their own, Shelby. He was good with the kids to take them fishing. He was always coming up with a four-wheeler or a dune buggy that they would have a lot of fun on. He was a kids. Um, he would do anything for them. After a couple of years of playing house with Melina and the girls, Phil grew restless. He started spending time with a younger, faster crowd. While hanging with his new friends, an attractive young woman caught his eye. That's how he met April. He got mixed up with the wrong crowd, and they just kept coming around, kept wanting him to come out, come out and join the party. And He was a little older than them, and he got to partying, drinking. And then uh, the crowd he was hanging around, and they were all, they were friends with April. She was really young. I think he's close to 10 years older than her. It was clear to Phil that 17-year-old April had a crush on him. But it didn't take long for Phil to feel the same, and their affair began. She would sit and wait at the convenience stores, hoping he would come through town, just so she could see him. She just kept chasing him until she got what she wanted. She was adamant on getting, getting him away from me. We'd try to get back together, and then... She would be coming around. April Quick, it was an affair that he was having on the side. He even got her a place to live in Mansfield, basically for his, his side chick. Before long, April was more than Phil's side chick. He was in love with her. I got where I didn't trust him because she was always coming around. and So I was about a year and a half at their relationship. I was like, that's enough. I was just like, okay, this is not good for my kids. So, I eventually filed for a divorce. In 1998, after a year and a half of Phil being unfaithful, Phil and Melina finalized their divorce, and Phil and April moved to Florida on a whim, leaving his family behind in Missouri. There, 18-year-old April became pregnant almost immediately. Phil struggled to transition from party life back to family life. He was a full-fledged alcoholic. I mean, he had to drink all the time. You know, when you become an alcoholic, your priorities are, are not your family, most of them. They're getting that next drink, see? Not long after their first child was born, April became pregnant again. But as their family continued to grow, so did Phil's addiction. And by early 2001, it was worse than ever. He began to abuse drugs and alcohol again. And the relationship really went bad. He uh, got so bad he had to do a major surgery and had gone into rehab. When he got out of rehab, they moved into her parents' house and she became pregnant with their third child. But once they moved out of there into another place, he began to abuse drugs and alcohol again. Eventually, Philip moved back to Florida and she stayed in Missouri with the kids. After moving back to Florida, Phil spiraled. And in 2007, he missed child support payments and it landed him in a Florida jail cell. After he had been arrested and put in jail, it's like it dried him up. They got drug free and he was like a different person. And that's when he, he came back here. A newly clean and sober Phil vowed to Melina and April that he was ready to be the father his five children needed him to be. He had a tunnel vision of what he was going to do, and it was for his kids. He had his mind right on track. He just concentrated on working and doing good things. He loved going to church. He reached out to my mother and um, wanted to try to build a relationship with me again. And so he started emailing me and it just kind of grew from there. He um, tried to make up for lost time and tried to get close to Shelby. He was like a different person. He came and opened up his own mechanic 
shop and was doing really good. But five months after his move back to Missouri, Phil's fresh start comes to a tragic end at a remote roadside park. His wallet had been taken out of his pocket. There was blood transfer on his pocket, and the wallet was laying between his legs, so it appeared that somebody had robbed him. But when investigators take a closer look at Phil's body, they make a disturbing discovery. He sent a gunshot wound to the head. And as we started examining and looking at things closer, there were uh, stab wounds to the back of the head. Well, this obviously was attacked from behind, which kind of led me to believe that there was two people. You know, maybe he was talking to someone and then someone jumped out from hiding and, and attacked him from behind. Was the robbery a cover-up to hide a more cold-blooded motive? There was two stab wounds to the chest. There were several to the back, several to the back of the head. One of his elbows, one of his forearms. Generally, when you see that type of aggression, you have some type of personal connection. Coming up, had Phil gotten mixed up with the wrong woman? He had a new girlfriend. Her name was Tammy. But she was still married at that time. And investigators discover that a dead man's cell phone is still on the move. It was hitting towers. We were able to see that phone definitely tracking south. More than likely... On September 10th, 2010, authorities are trying to determine who stabbed and shot local mechanic Phil Taylor at a roadside park in the Ozarks. It appeared that he was attacked initially from behind with, with a knife, and at, at some point, um, you know, was on the ground and, and someone came up and shot him. The single gunshot wound went directly into Phil's left temple. It appeared to be a close contact type wound. As you can tell that from looking at the wounds from the stipling and different things around it, the powder burns. So it appeared to be a, a close, up close and personal wound. The location of the stab wounds on Phil's head and torso indicate they probably came before the gunshot, likely in an attempt to incapacitate him. Whoever killed Phil left only one clue behind. One of the, the main things that we found was a 22 caliber brass that was near the body. So we're looking at some type of semi-automatic weapon. Other than that, the remote crime scene yields little information. But you're out in the middle of nowhere. There's no surveillance systems. There's, at that point, you know, initially no suspects. You're starting from scratch. But we're in rural communities where the sheriffs and the police officers know a lot of the people in that area. And the sheriff had dealings with them in the past. So we knew he was from Wright County. He had a repair shop up there that he was running. Early the next morning, investigators head to Phil's auto repair shop and meet with Marvin Elliott, Phil's friend and landlord. Marvin owns a mechanic shop, and Philip had a little shop to the side that he rented out and did his mechanic work. Marvin tells detectives, while Phil had his struggles in the past, he was currently devoted to two things, his children and his sobriety. He was trying to make things right in his life. He'd start paying child support. And basically, he was trying to turn his life around and start doing the right things. When he came back, he was like his old self. He had his life in line. He was all lined up. He knew what he had to do and wanted to do. Phil had been living in a trailer on his property, but was in the process of buying his own home. He'd just been approved. Phil got the loan, and so he was tickled about that. Marvin says he last saw Phil yesterday at around 6 p.m. as he was leaving the shop. He'd worked all day that day and had been tired, didn't feel like going out that evening, had a lot of work to do the following day. As far as a social life goes... I always had a girlfriend, you know what I mean? He didn't get serious very much. In fact, he shares that Phil had just met someone new online. Marvin had indicated to us that he had a new girlfriend. Her name was Tammy. I'd heard about her, but he wasn't serious or nothing about her. Rumor had it that Phil had recently taken a Tammy on a date that had gone sideways. Everybody knew that he'd been seeing her and had taken her to the river and there had been a confrontation there. 
they were having a nice day, kind of hanging out, and while they were there, they'd ran into a previous girlfriend of Phil's, and that there'd been a little bit of a heated exchange between this previous girlfriend and his current girlfriend. What's more, Phil's new love interest, Tammy, was still married. She was in the process of going through a divorce, and that but she was still married at that time. With relationship drama becoming a consistent trend in Phil's life, detectives are left to consider if this led to Phil's murder. In almost all homicides that I've worked, it's been somebody that's close to the victim. So you're looking for those relationships that go south. People make poor decisions at the time, and bad things happen. Marvin agrees to let investigators into Phil's trailer. We went into the trailer after Marvin opened it up, and, and it was small. You know, it, you could obviously tell that, that a single guy was living there. Inside, they find an empty cell phone box. Only investigators note they didn't find a cell phone at the crime scene. We were able to find out that he had recently purchased a cell phone. So with that, we were able to obtain a cell phone number for him from that cell phone box. We're able to do an emergency circumstance ping, and that allows us to, to get limited information off of that phone in order to be able to track it. As investigators continue to search the trailer, they discover another clue, a post-it note with the name Tammy written on it. As it had her name on it, then there were handwritten directions to her house in Marshville. Just before they leave, investigators find something else. We also located a certified letter to an April Quick. She lived in Mountain Home, Arkansas. There was an actual copy of a letter that he sent her indicating that he wanted to spend more time with his children and kind of get back involved in his children's lives. The letter said that he had previously sent another letter to her that she had never responded to. So he had said he'd been paying child support for two years and that if he wasn't allowed to see his children, he was going to take her to court. The letter is dated just two days prior, and it demands a response from April by September 18th, just a week after Phil's murder. His children. Investigators leave the trailer with not one, but two potential leads. We had the girlfriend in Marshville, or we had April Quick in, in Mountain Home, Arkansas. Both women are located about an hour away in opposite directions. Initially, we were focused on Tammy. With the information that we had, we felt that we needed to start towards Marshville. Investigators start the drive 40 miles north towards Tammy's house in Marshfield, Missouri. But just as they reach the county line, they get a call from the phone company, and it's a game changer. Phil's cell phone is still powered on. More than likely, whoever has his phone was involved in the murder was there when it happened. It was hitting towers. We were able to see that phone definitely tracking south towards Arkansas. This information came through and then immediately turned from there and headed back in the direction that we came. We had two things to go on at that point. We were following the evidence that we had in hand. Coming up... Investigators confront their two suspects. It was still a fairly new relationship, but she seemed upset. And later, could supermarket surveillance footage hold the key to finding Phil's killer? The woman on the video was a fairly short, stocky lady with short hair. From what we can tell, obviously it was not April. Investigators looking into the murder of Phil Taylor are following two leads. Phil's current love interest, Tammy, and his ex-girlfriend, April Quick. But the investigation takes a sharp turn when they discover Phil's cell phone is powered on and moving south towards Arkansas. April Quick lived in Mount Home, Arkansas. While Missouri detectives have yet to rule Tammy out as a person of interest... They also put out a bolo for April Quick. In the meantime, they contact Phil's first wife, Melina. It was hard to believe that it happened. I just hate it for the girls, you know. Sad to see the pain, but, you know, from him 
basically leaving their life twice. Last time, you know, permanently. She was, you know, in a, a decent relationship with him, and they talked occasionally, and she was fine with him seeing her daughter. Phil had confided in Melina that April Quick was less willing to let him back. Back in Missouri and wanted to, you know, try to make up for last time. He'd been out of her life for years and was trying basically to get back into her life and the children's life, and she didn't want him there. Phil told me he finally decided to send a certified letter. If she didn't respond to him, he was contacting an attorney to start the process of getting custody of the children. Did the letter push April over the edge? Before investigators explore that question, they need to rule out their other lead, Phil's online love interest, Tammy. Tammy voluntarily came in to talk to us. I mean, it was still a fairly new relationship, but uh, she seemed upset that, that he was gone and the relationship had been good. There was no problems. They had plans for the weekend after he was killed and uh, she'd been trying to call him and he hadn't contacted her back. And she was worried about it. But detectives' previous suspicions about Tammy subside when she explains her whereabouts the night of the murder. I think she had an alibi for where she was that night that we were able to check out. There was no red flags at all in her interview, nothing that caused me to think that she had anything to do with it. Investigators receive Phil's phone records for September 10th, the night of his murder, and immediately notice two incoming calls at around 9.30 p.m. There were two phone calls from an 870 number. That was an Arkansas number. So we wrote a search warrant to obtain the information on the phone. We learned that phone was a track phone out of Arkansas that was bought at a Walmart. The Walmart is just minutes from the home of April Quick. So we sent officers to that Walmart to try to identify who had purchased the phone. They were able to obtain video surveillance of the lady that had put those minutes on the phone. The woman on the video was a, a fairly short, stocky lady with short hair. When investigators compare the woman in the footage with April Quick's driver's license photo, they are in for a surprise. We can tell it obviously was not April, so we need to identify who this person is. April, of course, is on the radar. She's moving towards the front of the list, but we still need to figure out who this other woman is and what relationship she had with Philip Taylor and why she's contacting him. Hoping to catch a break, the investigators send a still from the surveillance video to the Mountain Home Police Department. It didn't take long before an officer looked at it and he said, that is Amy Harry. In fact, I was just called to her house where they reported some money and jewelry and a 22 caliber pistol stolen from the residence on Friday night, the same night the Phil was murdered. We had a 22 casing at the scene, and now we have a person the same night of a murder reporting a 22 pistol stolen. Amy Herring was in a relationship with April Quick. At that residence was April Quick and her children that she had with Philip Taylor and Amy Herring. That kind of helped tie a lot of things together as far as what the relationship is and why she would be having contact with Philip Taylor. Between the phone evidence and the stolen 22, investigators feel they have enough to pay a visit to April Quick. At this point, we've been able to rule out uh, any other names that have came up, and right now I think that the evidence is 100% leading towards April Quick and Amy Harry. On September 14th, four days after the murder, investigators contact April Quick for an interview. April voluntarily came to the sheriff's department. We were following up on Philip Taylor's death, which, of course, she had heard about. When they sit down with April, she is eager to talk about her relationship with Phil, one that she says began when she was only 17. She started a relationship with him, unaware that he was married to Melina Taylor at the time, is what she said, but that he'd gotten her a place to live in Mansfield, and that they continued their relationship for quite some time. April claims that after they moved to Florida, Phil's drug use escalated and he became abusive. He smacked me, hit me, shoved me in the wall, he threw me into the big ball and got through my head. And then he hit me with a stick and somehow he managed to feel like I was, it was my fault. 
once she became pregnant for the third time, April dumped Phil and headed back home. I said, let me raise my children. I said, unless you can straighten your ways and be a father, just leave us alone. Once back in Missouri, April found love in the arms of a woman, Amy Herring. For the past three years, she and Amy have been in a relationship, co-parenting April's three kids. So those kids are almost like her own children, aren't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. She's pretty good with them. Yeah, she's pretty good with them. Investigators ask April about the letters Phil sent requesting to see his kids again. She really basically had no contact with him. She thought he was on probation or parole, so she really wasn't too concerned about it, and she pretty much just ignored that letter. And then she told me that she'd gotten another letter on Friday the 10th. Um, then I get a letter last week, Friday, from the States, um, that he is living in Missouri, maybe owns his own shop, and that he wants to see his kids. April says before she could respond, she got the news that Phil had been murdered. News. When investigators question April on her whereabouts the night of the murder, April states that she and Amy dropped the kids off with her mom so they could go on a date to the movies. And she said they uh, went to a movie at 9 o'clock and got home about midnight, and they noticed that their place had been broken into. That's when they called police and reported some stolen jewelry, money, and a 22 caliber pistol. Investigators seize the opportunity. April, I know without a doubt that quite a bit of what you told us is a lie. Okay, I've got a lot of evidence that's stacked up against you. But instead of changing her tune, April shuts down the interview. I see where this is going. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'll get a lawyer. I'm done. Coming up, April drops a hint. Nothing's communicated. And a search warrant causes a change of heart. We were able to locate some burnt items in the backyard. I could tell it was a cell phone. How did you decide where to be? He said you had a lawyer. used to meet him. used to meet them. Investigators are interviewing April Quick about the murder of her ex, Phil Taylor, when she suddenly asks for an attorney. Right before she leaves the room, April makes an offhand but revealing comment. It was a very weird statement. I mean, if she's trying to pass blame that it was somebody else that, that murdered Philip, why would she essentially to confess to murdering but say it wasn't premeditated? April's girlfriend, Amy Herring, also requests an attorney. Ultimately, both women are charged with Phil's murder, and investigators head to their home to gather more evidence. We were able to search and locate some burnt items in the backyard in a bag. Initially looking at it, you could tell it was a cell phone. It was burned beyond the point where we could positively identify it as Phil's phone, but what we believe was his cell phone. There was clothing. Uh, in there that was partially burnt and then the knife we believe that he used in the murder as well so uh, we photograph it we seize it even more evidence investigators do a quick check on april and amy's alibi we went and obtained the video surveillance from the movie theater and they were not at the movie before investigators can make their next move they learn that april is ready to talk I advised her her rights. I again told her I respect your rights as an attorney. And the only reason you're here is because you want to talk to me. And I think at that point she kind of knew the gig was up, knew that we knew that they had done it, and wanted to explain her side of the story. April tells detectives that she called Phil after receiving the second letter. 
Yes, how the kids were. I told him how the kids were. And he said, I want to see him. I said, I want to discuss that. And he said, yes, I want to meet you. How did you decide where you were meeting? He said, you remember where we used to meet? We used to meet there when he was married to Lena. She stated that she set up the meeting at Roadside Park to talk to him about the kids. Given her past with Phil, April brought Amy and the 22 for protection. Because she said she was scared of Philip Taylor, that he had been very violent in the past. The women arrived at the park first. April asked Amy to hang back and stay hidden. I didn't want to have to explain the lesbian thing. That's why I wanted her to hide because I thought I was afraid she was dead and trying to get the kids. A little later, Philip had arrived. They had parked and gotten out, and they were talking between the vehicles. I said, we need me to want you to see the children. I said, they don't even know you who you are. And then he said, you're not going to keep my children away from me, you bitch. And he grabbed me and just started. for her to get the gun. Fearful now for her lover's safety, April did just that. Her and little Amy had the gun in the truck. And she said they were struggling. So I had the gun. And I had the gun. And I had the gun with both of our hands. And I really freaked out. <laughs> Afterward, they took the cash from Phil's wallet to make it look like a robbery. They also took his cell phone. And they put his phone, their clothing, a knife, and all those things in a bag and stopped on Highway J and set that bag on fire. They left, they said they threw the gun out the window of their car, and then they went home. The next day, April grew concerned that someone might find bag with the burnt evidence, she returned and brought it back home. We've seen that several times in cases where people burn evidence related to the crime and were able to sift through that to find out that they were connected to the crime. The thing that did surprise me is that they took it back to their house. The knife, the phone, all that, he burnt the knife too. She, she had everything in the bag. I just picked it up, but it didn't burn. Okay. When you get home, whose idea was it? April also confirms the knife found was the one used in the attack. Investigators finally have a confession, only it doesn't quite match the evidence. I felt that she was being somewhat accurate with, with most of the information that she was providing us, except everything with the gunshot. The gunshot uh, wound evidence indicated that it was made at close range and for her to be merely grabbing a gun uh, from a vehicle and handing it to Amy and it just accidentally goes off it did not meet the evidence that we were looking at. Then investigators learned that they might have one more shot at getting the truth. The detention officers there at Baxter County came up and told us that, that Amy Herring would now like to speak with us. Coming up, Amy takes the fall for her lover. And investigators must determine was this self defense or cold blooded murder? They didn't contact the authorities. They tried to destroy all the evidence in this case. April 
Will Quick has just confessed to accidentally killing him following an altercation at a roadside park. Then April's lover Amy Herring comes forward with her version of what happened that night. She stated that they tried to contact Philip to speak about the children. He was threatening lawyers and everything else. We decided that since we were in town, that we should call him, you know, speak to him. They had met there at the roadside park and that he had gotten physical with April and then she stated that she jumped out and stabbed him. And then he's pushing on her and he's too busy worried about her. He didn't even see me find him ran around the truck and I started stabbing him in the back of the neck. And then he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I stabbed him until he hit the ground. And I shot him in the head. Because he was pushing on her. April had told one of the other guys that you had told her to get the gun. And that both of you guys had hold the gun when it went off. She didn't have the gun. She didn't. Maybe I did tell her to get the gun. I don't want to answer that because I don't remember. She made a lot of statements, basically volunteering her guilt, but not giving the whole story. I thought some of the statements were a little far-fetched, but it became very obvious that we had the right people. With the two women in custody, investigators take a close look at the claims Phil was abusive. They find no police reports to back the accusations. They reach out to the woman who knew Phil in both the depths of his addiction and heights of his recovery, Phil's first wife, Melina Aldridge. He was not a violent person. When he was there and was not into alcohol or drugs, he was a really good father. You know, as a part of this investigation, we, we did a lot of follow-up uh, interviews with people that knew have been were acquainted with Philip and people that may have been involved in past relationship with him, ex-wives and girlfriends. And when I asked if he'd ever been violent with it, all of them said no. You know, aside from April Quick, that's the only person that we found that indicated Philip had any type of violent past. As for their claims that Phil attacked them on the day of the murder... If he did, both Amy and April walked away unscathed. Had this really been a self-defense, I would have expected the authorities. What they did is they took a hundred bucks out of his wallet, they stole his cell phone, tried to destroy all the evidence in this case, and knew that they were on a killing. When it comes to what happened that night, to investigators, there's only one explanation. I think that they planned to meet him there. The letter just kind of pushed things over the edge, and, and they snapped. They planned this murder, and then they filed a false report in Mountain Home, Arkansas, to say that your home was burglarized and the murder weapon was stolen. Facing overwhelming evidence against them that they conspired to kill Phil Taylor, both Amy and April agreed to plead out. They're only way of escaping a first-degree murder conviction was to take a plea bargain to a second-degree murder. Amy Herring and April Quick were charged with second-degree murder. They eventually pled guilty, and Amy was sentenced to 15 years in prison, and April Quick was sentenced to 20 years. People I talked to, they're like, I cannot believe that's all she got. What do you do? It's like, I think she deserved more. I think he was remembered as a family man. He was hardworking and caring. He would do anything for his kids. Just a good brother, uncle. So I can't ever see him. I can't hug him. Walk me down the aisle. I miss my dad. or something that will bring him back. Night, huh? Shout 
猪们赶紧穿下水裤啊，我操，穿到了，穿到一个了，就在那里。别踩，别踩！那不要拱又出来了，那是是的，小甲鱼。把手机跟拍一下，要不然我换一下手机，换一下裤子来。拿着，拿着，拿着。看完了。吹着下去。干底了，已经干底了。还没开始，大哥们不要急，不要慌。那大哥们衣服都还没穿，你们慌啥嘞？这已经开始搞了，弹幕也开始搞了嘛。大哥的还没开始穿衣服，对不对？大哥们，别慌。啊、对呀、啊，他等着弹幕抽奖嘞。别慌，别慌，大哥们，别慌。等大哥们把下水裤穿好，咱们会下去的。现在可以了，现在这个中奖的也能发个奖金宝宝。抓鱼呀！抓鱼了，大哥们。这鱼在这里，不要不要不要动。鱼在哪里？哈今天节目是大哥插甲鱼的，大哥插甲鱼。我我哪带头？你们他妈两个都比我高，你叫我带头？我等着你们两个老大哥。不是沙